Good evening, and welcome to this virtual Commonwealth Cub Humanities Forum. I'm Farhad Manju, opinion columnist for the New York Times and your moderator for this evening. Presently, the Commonwealth Club has suspended its in-person programming, but hosting special events, uh, include virtual events, including this one. You can learn about our upcoming virtual events or become a member by visiting www.commonwealthclub.org. We are grateful for the generous support of our members and donors and hope you will consider making a donation online or text donate to 415-329-4231. We also encourage you to like, subscribe and share videos like this one with your friends and family. Uh, during our program, we will have time for your questions. Please submit those in the chat box. We would also like to thank George Hammond for helping coordinate today's program. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jesse Wegman, member of the New York Times editorial board and author of Let the People Pick the President, The Case for Abolishing the Electoral College. Jesse joined the Times uh, editorial board in 2013 and has written ex extensively about legal matters and the US Supreme Court. He has previously worked for a number of media outlets and publications, including uh, National Public Radio, The Daily Beast, Newsweek, Reuters, and The New York Observer. Jesse graduated from New York, City, New, York, New York University School of Law in 2005 and received a Soros Justice Fellowship in 2010. Please join me in welcoming Jesse Wegman. Hey, Jesse. Hi, Farhad. Thanks for having me. Thanks. So as a Californian, I've always hated the Electoral College. Um, you know, it's like transparently one of those efforts to, I think, reduce my democratic power. And so, you know, it seems to me, and it also just seems, has long seemed kind of manifestly unfair, like intellectually indefensible. And so I really like didn't think that I would be able to hate the Electoral College more. But after reading your book, you really added a lot of like ammunition to my argument. And uh, I gotta say, like, it, it feels even less justifiable to me. So, but like, so I wanna talk about all of that and see if it's possible to change the Electoral College and see what you think about that. Um, uh, but let's just start with the obvious sort of five minute intro. What is the case against the Electoral College? Uh, well, I'll just say this, uh, as much as you hate the Electoral College as a Californian, uh, imagine how the Republicans in your state feel. <laughs> sorry, yeah. to, sorry to ascribe a, a, a party to you, but right. I'm, I'm assuming, no, I, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, four and a half million people in California voted for Donald Trump in 2016. Four and a half million people, right? And not a single one of their votes counted when it came to the real election for president, which happened on December 19th when electors cast their ballots. And that's because California, like all other states except for two, uh, awards their electors uh, based on the winner take all rule, the state winner take all rule, which is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's when states mm -hmm. give all of their electors to the candidate who wins the most votes in their state. In California, uh, for several decades, that has been the Democrat. So Hillary Clinton easily won California. And every single of those four and a half million votes for Donald Trump disappeared into thin air. You see that happen all across the country in every state uh, that's considered a safe state for one party or the other. And that's really the heart for me, and I think for a lot of the, the college's critics, of the distortion that the college causes in American politics and governance today, which is that so many Americans are essentially erased in the in the election, in their voting, and in their the, the attention that is not paid to them by both mm -hmm. candidates. Um, and that really, that's that's a kind of a fundamental perversion of representative democracy when the person running for the office that requires representing the entire country, all people equally, actually only has to care about tiny slivers of those people in a few random battleground states. That's that, right. that's the that's the way the college operates today, and it's the way the college has operated for most of its history. And I think it's what we really need to change. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about it is I hadn't quite considered it this way before, but it's not just the Electoral College, but it's really specifically the state winner take all rules, um, which are not kind of a fundamental feature of the Electoral College. And, um, you know, we think of it as like they're, they're kind of obviously sort of, they seem to us as being the same thing, but they're in subtle ways and in like legal ways different. Can you can you talk about that? It's a great point, And I thank you for bringing it up. So. Um, when we argue about the Electoral College today and people either say, I hate the Electoral College or I love the Electoral College or save the Electoral College or, you know, destroy it. 
I always want to ask people, what are, what do you know what you're talking about? Like which, what part of the electoral college upsets you or mm -hmm. excites you? And I think most people don't quite know which part they're talking about. And they also don't know where it exists in our legal structure. And so that's mm -hmm. the question you're asking here. The electoral college in the constitution, which I think is what most people think they're talking about when they say right. this, is actually a pretty bare bones institution, right? It, it has a few rules. Um, the main one is that every state that, well, the main one is that electors choose the president, not we the people, right? I think that's mm -hmm. something that a few, a, few, a few people, maybe even a few million people still don't understand. Uh, they think they elect the president directly. In fact, electors, right. 538 electors choose the president. Um, but the, the allocation of those electors among the states is determined by the constitution. And the way that, that the constitution does it is to say each state gets the same number of electors that it has members in Congress. So that means their representatives in the house, and their senators. California mm -hmm. has 50, 53 members of the House, two senators, so California gets 55 electoral votes. Beyond that, there's very little constitutionally about the Electoral College that is required. Everything else that we know about how the Electoral College functions today and what we assume is natural to its functioning, which is that state winner take all rule that I mentioned, and also the fact that we get to vote for electors ourselves at all, which is also not in the right. constitution. None of that is constitutional. It is all state laws that, that set that up. And so I think that's something that people don't realize and it actually opens up a lot of avenues for reform, which is that this uh -huh. is a state, a fundamentally state-based institution and it doesn't have to operate the way it does today. Yeah, I, I was um, like, I think I sort of knew this uh, vaguely, but it seems clear like after reading how you detail this, we, we don't even have a right to vote for the president. Like that is not a sort of enshrined right in the constitution. Yeah, it was a sort of a passing note in Bush v. Gore that um, people didn't really pay attention to at the time because everyone was focused on who won Florida, right? Uh -huh. But actually Justice Scalia at the time said this in his uh, concurring opinion to the, to the Bush v. Gore ruling in 2000, which was he said, by the way, the state lawmakers don't have to give you any vote. You don't have to. We have no constitutional right as citizens and as voters to play any role in the selection of the president at all. It is we are right. purely at the mercy of our state lawmakers. Now, as it happens, states have given the public, the eligible voting public, the right to choose the electors directly by voting for them in the voting booth. Uh, pretty much uh, across the board since the mid 19th century. The last time a state didn't do that, 1876 in Colorado. But, but since then, every single state has allowed for popular vote. But they don't have to. A state tomorrow mm -hmm. could say, you know what? We think this democracy thing is crazy. It's just, we don't trust people. We, right. don't, like, we, don't, we don't think people are stupid. We're gonna take it back for ourselves and do it ourselves. Um, they're not gonna do that, right, in the 21st century, but they could. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, and then also states have done this winner take all rule whereby they give, they, they, they arrogate more power to themselves, sort of more political clout to themselves by saying to a party, one party, hey, we're going to give all of our electors to your candidate because, you right. know, our state is, is favors your candidate. That's a, that's, that's a powerful thing to say. Uh, and so most, all, all but two states today do that. Maine and Nebraska don't use that system, but all the other states do and they have for, for you know, generations. So I think when you pull those apart and you say, actually, wait a minute, we could do this a different way. It really opens up the possibilities for how we could change the way we choose the president. Although in some ways, this, the fact that states do it rather than the uh, federal government, rather than sort of having an explicit federal he role here, also has led to the distortion that we have now, right? Because like the, the kind of the to the states did this, each of them has sort of like a game theory, like this reason to increase their political power. And so for them, winner take all is sort of a rational move. Um, and it's very hard to undo. Well, absolutely. Thomas Jefferson said this back in 1800. He understood. So, you know, let's go back for a minute to the beginning. You know, 1787, uh -huh. the founders, uh, you know, they go to Philadelphia, the, the framers of the Constitution create this new document, which has a president for the first time. And they have to decide, how are we going to choose the president? Right. And that's it is the most vexing question at the whole for the whole summer. They fight about it for weeks on end. They hold 30 different votes about different ways to do it. Congress elects the president. The state governors elect the president. The people elect the president. Uh, and then they come up with this system in the waning days of the convention, primarily because they were completely exhausted. They wanted to get the hell out of there and they wanted to get this document out to the states for ratification. 
And, you know, James Madison admits it after the fact. He says, uh, he basically says, yeah, you know what? We were pretty tired at that point. Um, and, what, and what we did and the, and the system that we built kind of reflects that fatigue. The, what, what I think is really important to remember is the framers knew that whatever system they chose, George Washington was going to be the first president. So the stakes were sort of low. It didn't really mm -hmm. matter what system they chose because they knew who was going to be the president. As soon as George Washington steps down, in 1796, he says, I'm not running for a third term. The whole system blows up. At the same time that he's stepping down, we're seeing the development of national political parties. And all of a sudden, the whole idea behind the Electoral College, which was, as Alexander Hamilton writes in the Federalist Papers, this body of distinguished men who are supposed to sit, sit there and deliberate and be those kind of pl ideal platonic uh, in independent thinkers and choose for themselves who will be the best leader of the country, that's blown out of the water. Right. And what you get in its place are party lackeys on both sides who are voting for their party's leader, regardless of who they think is the best person for the country. Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson. And, and, and so that's one thing that happens. And then the other is states start use, start jumping on this winner take all bandwagon, which they weren't all yeah. doing at the beginning. Some states used it by congressional district. Some states, uh, th those were the two main divides at the time, winner take all and congressional district. Thomas Jefferson saw the states running in the direction of winner take all. And he said, if other states are doing it, it would be folly for our state not to do uh -huh. it, you know? So right. they, right. it was clear at the time that winner take all is a very, um, uh, right, it's very hard and no state is going to unilaterally disarm uh, once mm -hmm. they've all got winner take all. So that's another, that's another hurdle you have to get over in uh, changing this system. And, it's, and I'm happy to talk about the, the method for doing that. Right. Well, just one more thing about, about sort of its creation. I mean, I think if we were coming up with a a way to elect a national leader now, it seems like we have the technology and we have um, the kind of mindset that I think pretty quickly people would decide a popular vote is how you do it. I mean, like you see it on like when they want to pick the American Idol winner and they like use a popular vote. Like it just seems kind of an obvious way to do it. Why was it not obvious back then? What sort of problems did the Electoral College solve for framers for the young United States? Sure. So there were a few problems. One is um, the obvious one of technological limitations of the time. You know, at the time, the country is much smaller. Uh, there's no transportation network. Everybody stays very close to home. Mm -hmm. They don't know anything about the world beyond their home. There's no, there's no real uh, communications network to speak of. So there's no media. There's no real media infrastructure. Yeah. So while the framers did trust people to vote directly for their members of the House of, of Representatives, which they considered to be the most powerful branch of government, Mm -hmm. um, that, that's sort of just a complicating part of the story when people say, oh, the founders feared democracy. Right. That's not quite There's right. There's a defense of this that like the Electoral College is meant to right. sort of uh, um, reduce, like it, the, the founders just didn't trust uh, people to, to vote. But, but it, you're saying it's more subtle than that. It's much more subtle than that. They actually trusted people completely, uh, trusted eligible voters, let's, if let's you were remember. Certain race, if right. you were certain, <laughs> right, right. If you were a, a propertied white male. So that's, that's a different yeah. problem. We'll get to that right. in a second. But they did trust the voters to choose uh -huh. their representatives directly. That's because they knew who they were because they were representing their district. But when you were talking about a national leader, you know, for a country that a tiny fraction of the size of ours today, but still much bigger than anything any of them had had to develop a government for before, they thought they didn't believe that people could know enough about those national candidates. And so they said, let's give it to a body of electors who will know more. Um, as I said, that whole system blew up in within just a few years, but that was one of the constraints that I think they were considering when thinking about how to elect the president. Another one, as we just hinted at, um, was the existence of slavery and yeah. the battle between the North and the South over that institution. Obviously, um, that fight colored all of the debates at the convention, everything about the creation of the Senate to the three-fifths clause, you know, all of these things were central to both the maintenance of slavery and also to the creation of the Electoral College. And, I, and one thing that was really fascinating is to see how those debates played out in the creation of the college. And I just want to read you just a very brief passage here. Um, this is in the middle of July. So right in the middle of the summer, uh, the, um, the, the, the delegates have, have hashed out the shape of our, of our national legislature, right? They've created the Senate. They've created the House of Representatives. People are very upset, particularly in the bigger states, because they had to give up a lot of power in the creation of the Senate. So there's a lot of sort of hurt feelings right now. And it's mid-July. Um, and James Madison, 
uh, who is, you know, widely regarded as the father of the Constitution. He wrote the first draft of the Constitution that, that they've worked off of for the first several weeks. Um, you know, brilliant uh, political thinker and, you know, obviously philosopher of governance. And uh, he, he uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a nationalist, right? He believes in uh, sort of uh, having a supreme government, uh, mm -hmm. uh, national government, but he also, he's a southerner uh, and he's a slaveholder. Um, so he kind of straddles the line and he's always, he is always a little ambivalent about where he stands. So Madison um, uh, comes up and they start talking about how do we choose the president? This is in mid July. And they say, um, there's, there's a push for doing a popular vote for president. Several of the top uh, delegates, and this is an amazing part of the story, actually supported a popular vote. And Madison says, uh, he believes that a popular vote was in his opinion, the fittest in itself for choosing a a, a president and would be as likely as any method to produce an executive of distinguished character. And then he says, there was one difficulty, however, of a serious nature regarding a popular vote. And he says, the right of suffrage of voting was much more diffusive in the Northern than the Southern states. And the latter could have no influence in the election on the score of the Negroes. So, you know, it took us a long time in American history to sort of talk openly about that fact, but they were speaking yeah. about it completely bluntly and without, you know, on the floor of the uh, Constitutional Convention 230 years ago, they were saying, of course, slavery is, is central to this. So I think we can't eliminate right. that, that element either. Yeah. And, and so just, um, to, just to clarify, sorry, right. the reason he was saying that was, if the point wasn't obvious, when the South has 40, 50% of, of its residents are enslaved black people who have, don't have the right to vote, if you had a popular vote, those states would have a lot less influence in the choice of the president. And that's why Madison was saying they will never go for a popular vote because they're not gonna right. want, you know, they're not gonna have the kind of power that they would have if they actually let slaves vote. Right. Um, really, like one thing I wondered about, one thing I, I thought was interesting is that like one of the ways we defend one of the ways the college is defended now is is um, is also about big states and small states, but it's also this question of kind of the urban rural divide, um, and you know that has be become sort of a, the big um, uh, chasm in, in in our politics today. Um, and I wonder if you if that had uh, if that had resonance then, and sort of how that became kind of one of the ways that uh, the college is is um, defended now. So let's get one thing out of the way first. There was no urban rural divide in 1787, yeah. <laughs> right? There were no uh -huh. cities. I mean, there were cities, but the cities were tiny by modern standards. I think um, New York was maybe 30,000 people. Uh, you know, I mean, there was no, there, you didn't see that kind of divide. The, the, you know, yeah. there was a dis difference between big states and small states. And that was certainly a, a battle line during the convention, right? We saw, as I, as I said, the Senate, the, the very creation of the Senate, uh, you know, right. that line cut through that debate. Um, but even then, just think about how how intense the debate was in 1787. The, the difference in size between the biggest state and the smallest state in 1787 it was 13 to one. That was that was mm -hmm. that was the ratio. And if you and if you only counted eligible voters, it was six to one. Today, the ratio between the biggest state and the smallest state is 70 to one. That means California. Yeah. You're, you're I'm not, on the wrong end of that. You're on the wrong end of that. You're on the 70 side, yeah. and Wyoming yeah. is is one. So. Imagine the framers were horrified enough by a ratio of six to one, and now it's mm -hmm. 70 to one. So, yeah. so let's talk about, well, what's the, what is the actual effect today? Putting us, let, let, first to get out of the way this question of, is that why the framers created the, Const the Electoral College? No, of course it wasn't. That wasn't the world they were faced with. That wasn't why they did this. What's the impact today of the Electoral College? Does the Electoral College actually protect? Yeah. How are we going to put it? Smaller states or more rural states? People often conflate those ideas, but they're actually mm -hmm. not the same. There's a huge right. number of rural areas in California and New York. Um, there are some mm -hmm. very urban small states. But does how does the Electoral College affect that balance and that dynamic? In fact, it's really interesting. And it's one of the main misconceptions that I deal with in the book, which is that the college does not benefit big cities over small states. The college does not protect small states from being, you know, devoured by the big cities. In fact, the college does give, what the college gives weight to are these battleground states, right? And this yeah. year, they're gonna be maybe six of them, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida, Arizona, and North Carolina. 
Okay, that's right. six states, 44 other states don't matter to the outcome of the election. That's the real divide is between safe states and battleground states and not between cities and rural areas or big states and small states. All, big states, small states, medium states are all safe states. So they all get disregarded by the candidates because they know it's with this winner take all rule, whatever they do is not going to matter in those states. So they don't go, they don't go campaign there. They don't, they don't aim their policy platforms at the mm -hmm. interests of Californians or New Yorkers mm -hmm. or Texans, right? Because right. why? Yeah, I mean, what, one of the, one of the reasons I've, I've really started to, um, I mean, this, this is a feature of Senate and it's a feature of the Electoral College, but I, I feel like we have huge problems here in California in terms of housing costs, um, transportation, uh, just like the lack of infrastructure, um, a lot of problems. And, and we have, um, you know, we are huge donors to uh, the Democratic Party, a huge source of kind of money for uh, politicians of all. Uh, and we don't like our issues are just not national issues because like uh, the Electoral College means that like uh, presidential candidates don't have to campaign here, don't have to. Um, and um, and uh, we have we don't have enough power in the Senate. And like so all of these problems get together. And it turns out, like, I feel completely ignored as a as a voter. And um, and I hadn't really thought about this, like until reading your book about and, and thinking about the battleground states. Like, I just feel like I've never. Um, like, like I've been voting, you know, for 20 years for president. I feel like no presidential candidate has ever sort of designed a policy platform for me as a Californian. Like it's just never happened. Like I like presidential candidates because of like right. charisma or whatever, not for yep. what they're going to do for me as a Californian. Right. And, and isn't it infuriating <laughs> that, yeah, nobody, like, that, that nobody cares about you? You're in, you're in a very big uh, a group, which is 80% of Americans, more than 100 million voters don't count. Mm -hmm. And and it's not just the campaigns, right? A lot of people say, oh, I'm glad that I'm not being bombarded with advertisements. <laughs> but you know what those advertisements translate into, right? Which is policy priorities and also to governance. You look at how presidents of both parties govern and you see that they lavish a lot more attention on battleground states than safe states. There's really interesting mm -hmm. research done that I write about in, in the last chapter of the book that looks at what they call the pork barrel presidency, which is, you know, we think about Congress as really having control of the purse strings, right? But actually the president has a lot more control over a lot more money, both in terms of federal grants, um, you know, disaster relief declarations, all of that, uh, than, than I think a lot of people realize. And when you actually look at where presidents steer that money, it is systematically more money to battleground states than non-battleground states and even more in the lead up to an election. So Barack Obama right. did it. Donald Trump is doing it. You know, Donald Trump right now is treating California New Yorkers like like an expendable, like expendable states. Right. I think right. He's, pretty, he's pretty blunt about that. And I appreciate uh -huh. in so many ways, I appreciate his bluntness because I feel like at least we're not pretending something, <laughs> you know, is not true that <laughs> is true. Um, but right. Barack Obama did it, did his own version of it too, and steered a lot of attention and money towards Ohio because Ohio, I think, is trending away from being a battleground state. But it was a battleground state in two thousand eight, mm -hmm. and it probably was one in twenty twelve too. So that that just that distortion of political interests, um, the 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 exclusion of the vast majority of Americans' interests. Um, you know, in, in the presidential race and in the governance of the country is so destructive to our ability to feel like we're part of a representative democracy where our vote matters and our voice matters. Right. Um, no, and, and so I felt after the 2000 election where, where this happened, where, uh, the, where George W. Bush didn't win the popular vote. Um, like, I remember thinking, something someone is going to do something about this there's got to be a change because like it and then and then i also thought oh this is going to be like a one-off like i think there was an idea that it would be an exception and now and then it happened again in 2016 and it seems like it, it could very plausibly happen again like um it seems like each time that happens you got to have this kind of corresponding reduction in like a feeling of democratic right. legitimacy um how much more of that can we yeah. go can we endure that's it's a great question and i think there's something important to remember here in terms of the arc of our history it's actually 2016 was the fifth time that it's happened mm -hmm. right the first time is 1824 
Then it happens again twice at the end of the 19th century, 1876 and 1888. And then it doesn't happen again until 2000. So when it happened in 2000, no one alive, you know, had experienced a split election. And it was yeah. a shock to all of us, I think, because I don't think the vast majority of Americans realize that's how we elect our president and that it was even it possible didn't seem for possible, something like right. that to happen. Right. Yeah. But here's the difference. The difference between 2000 and 2016 and 1888, 1876 and 1824 is that 2000 and 2016 are the only time in our history when we really have had the closest thing we possibly could have to full enfranchisement, okay, where everybody can vote. We're all mm -hmm. eligible adults with a few exceptions, important exceptions, like people with a criminal conviction, um, and in some narrow cases, people with mental uh, issues or, or sort of, um, you know, who aren't, who are considered mentally unable to, to cast a ballot. The, the, those are relatively small populations, um, but important ones. Uh, before 1965 and the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, you know, back in the 19th century, still, you know, the last time it had happened, women couldn't vote, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. right. um, black right. people had only just gotten the vote, uh, so it was, but they were, it was, but they were being terrorized. Actual, yeah, it, it was not unusual at the time for people's it, votes to not count. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's right. my point. And in 2000, yeah. 2016, it, it was so much more of a violation of what I think we had come to understand as what American democracy is, which is uh -huh. one person, one vote, right? Those cases happened in the 1960s. And that was a true like revolution in representative democracy, the idea that everybody's vote would count the same because it hadn't before then. And mm -hmm. then you have the Voting Rights Act, which sort of implements at long last the 15th Amendment to the Constitution and really makes voting for every, you know, voting, uh, uh, you know, prevents uh, discrimination based on race, which it was still rampant at the time is still happening today. Um, but, you know, I think that was really the kind of what was the deep offense of 2000 and 2016. And I do think your question was, um, how much more can we take of this? Yeah. You know, I mean, look, we've been like, a lot has happened in the last four years that I thought nobody <laughs> would tolerate. And yet, yeah. you know, it's the the boiling frog uh, metaphor, you know, it's like um, people seem to adapt to a lot of things that I thought they, they couldn't adapt to. But I will say, I just don't think in a modern constitutional democracy that a minoritarian presidency can survive much longer. So if Trump yeah. were to win again, and it certainly would be Trump, it would not be the Democratic candidate, at least not in this environment, uh, would win the Electoral College while losing the popular vote. You know, I really think I really think we're in for some serious unrest at that point. I mean, yeah. socially distance unrest, but, you know, still. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask about kind of the, the efforts to reform this. Uh, but before that, I guess I just want to know how have people responded to your argument? Because I feel like one of the problems we have in this in this environment is that it's not possible to make an argument like yours and have people on the other side think you're making a good faith political argument. Like right. we live in extremely partisan times yeah. and it seems like, uh, and, and you know, like the parties have switched on things like, I don't know, the filibuster, who should, whether a president should be impeached for certain things. Like, it seems like we switch our political positions based on like the outcome right. often. And I wonder if you get accused of just, you know, wanting this because it'll be good for Democrats. And how do you respond to that? Argument? Oh, sure. I mean, in the intro, in the introduction to the book, I say, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you're thinking, of course, this guy wants to abolish the Electoral College. Yeah. You know, he's a card carrying member of the liberal elite media. Um, and I get that. You know, I, what I would what I would ask people to do is, you know, don't shoot the messenger. Like <clears throat> the amazing thing about the Electoral College is it has been the most um, uh, 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 attacked provision of the Constitution by far over our history. There have been more than 700 attempts to amend or abolish the Electoral College since the beginning of the nation's history. Uh, that is far more than for any other part of the Constitution. People have hated this thing from the start, and it's not Democrats who hated it or Republicans or liberals or conservatives. It's everybody. And that's because mm -hmm. I think it has it has gored everyone's ox at one point or another, and uh -huh. people realize the fundamental violations of basic uh, political equality, which is the sort of the idea of one person, one vote, and of majority rule, which is, as we talked about at the beginning, the way we elect every other person in the country, the person who gets the most votes wins. It's a child understands that logic, right? And so yeah. I think, I think you know, we, it looks partisan today, 
because both times in 2000 and 2016, it happened that the Republican won the college while losing a popular vote. It didn't have to happen that way. And in fact, it has come very close to happening the other way. In 2004, I recount the story of how with 60,000 votes changing in Ohio, uh, John Kerry would have been president, even though George W. Bush won the popular vote nationally by 3 million votes. So it can go the other way. Um, mm -hmm. But before November 7th, 2000, when we elected, you know, when the people, more people voted for Al Gore and George W. Bush became president, this was not seen as a partisan issue. In fact, I quote in my, in the book jacket, uh, the opening quote is, the electoral college is a disaster for democracy. Who said that? Not a liberal, you know, New York Times writer, but Donald Trump in 2012 mm -hmm. on election night <laughs> when he thought that Mitt Romney was going to pull away with the popular vote win, but lose the electoral college to Barack Obama. He was furious. And I was like, amen. You know, I know how yeah. you feel, man. Like this has uh -huh. happened to me twice now. And just even the uh -huh. hint that it would happen to you, you know, you fly off the handle. He tweeted a few minutes later, more votes equals a loss revolution, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I think that this idea that it's somehow a democratic sour grapes thing is just completely misses the history of the opposition to the Electoral College and really what's at its core. But do you think, like, what's the, um, is there any kind of practical, like, uh, what's what's the sell here for a Republican? Like, it's gonna be obviously bad for a Republican right now, for Republicans right now to do this. What What is the, um, what do they benefit from this in the long run, perhaps? So here's how they benefit. Um, Yes, as long as the Republican Party is the party of Trumpism, of sort of white grievance, of narrowing electorate bases that really focus on older white voters and particularly older white male voters, um, yes, they are going to run into trouble with the popular vote nationally. That is not um, a fait accompli, right? They don't have, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, as I just said, George W. Bush easily won the popular vote in 2004. That's not so long ago, um, mm -hmm. by the same margin that Hillary Clinton won it in 2016. Uh, <clears throat> when you look over the, the whole history of the last 80 years, in fact, you've had uh, about 1.5 billion votes cast for president. The parties are separated in that time by about 700,000 votes. It's a virtual tie. And the point is that parties are always adapting to the realities on the ground. Right now, the Republicans are in a spot where they have decided it is more uh, politically ad and electorally advantageous to them to, to go this the Trump route, right? And look, they drew an inside straight. Steve Bannon said Trump had to draw an inside straight to win in 2016, and he did. Uh, but mm -hmm. you're not going to draw an inside straight every time. Texas yeah. is obviously trending blue. Georgia is trending blue. Arizona may even turn blue this year. And forgive me, I actually hate blue and red, um, the, using the terms blue states and red states because it's the, my book is like the cover of my book is purple, right? This is a, it's a purple country. There are millions of voters of all parties everywhere. Um, but for the moment, just the point being, um, you know, once, let's say those states turn, you are going to see Republicans everywhere say, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't like this electoral college idea anymore. I don't want these states to give all of their electors to the Democrat when I'm still right. a Republican. So once you see that happen, I actually think we're going to have a complete you know, transformation in how we talk about this. Um, I, you, that point about red states and blue states is so, I, th I found that really interesting. And like, I started thinking about, I mean, one thing that I feel has been a dominant factor of kind of political life since 2000 is the is these maps with red and blue and the maps are super distorting like in the way Donald Trump talks about it is super distorting because you have this idea that like obviously visually most of the country is one way um, or another and like you know I, I think that we don't pause enough in the world to think about how we abstract certain things like intellectual yes. concepts into like the, the real world and like um, you know, state, the whole idea of states are like an abstraction and like the whole idea that like everyone around you is a, of the same political color right. is just like a, a story right. that is fed in like media and everything else. And we come right. to believe it. And I think it's reinforcing in a terrible way about like what our political culture is like. This is exactly true. I mean, people are, I, I see people on Twitter or Facebook say, oh, California is going to impose its will on the rest of the country. I'm like, what are you talking about? California doesn't have a will. California has 40 million <laughs> residents, right. maybe 12 million of them vote. 
8 million of them voted for the Democrat, 4 million of them, give or take, voted for the Republican. That's what California has. And all of those voters should count equally when we're choosing the president, just as they should yeah. in every other state, right? So mm -hmm. this idea of red states, blue states, it's just, it, you're right. It's an abstraction that is so um, harmful, I think, to the way we think about our, our fellow Americans and to the structure of the country, which is a fundamentally purple country. Everybody lives yeah. everywhere and people don't vote. This is a really key point. People don't vote based on the state they live in. This, there's this kind of fetishization of states in the, in, in the presidential election, right? I, I, I put aside for the moment voting for your governor. Of course, you're voting as a resident of your state for your governor or for your state lawmakers or for even for your senators, maybe. But really, mm -hmm. when you're voting for the president, you're not voting. You, you Farhad, don't vote the way you do because you live in California. You vote the way you do because of your political ideology, right. because of your political mm -hmm. leanings. That's how everybody yeah. votes. Right. Yeah. If you moved, if you moved to Wyoming, you would still vote the same way you vote now. And so I think this idea that states are voting for somebody or it's just it's just such a distorting abstraction. In fact, people vote and they vote the way they want. They vote because of what they believe politically, not because of where they live. Yeah. Um, OK, let's talk about the, the sort of uh, preeminent effort to uh, reform, to get rid of the Electoral College. How t tell me about the interstate compact. Sure. So. There's this thing called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Um, I said before, there have been 700, more than 700 efforts to amend or abolish the college. Those are constitutional amendment efforts, right? So those are mm -hmm. literally going through the constitution and going through that process. It has failed because it's a very hard thing to do. One of the it's most- hard fun, to amend the constitution. Right, one of the most fun chapters of my book is chapter five, where I tell the story of how we got the closest of all to actually abolishing the constitution in favor of a popular vote. It happened in the late 1960s. Nobody remembers it today and it got remarkably close, but it failed yeah. even then. And that had been 80 years since we had seen a split election like we've now seen twice in the last two decades. So that was sort of the ideal circumstances for it to happen under and it still failed then. I'm not putting too many, uh, too many of my hopes in, in that basket. So what's the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact? So this was devised about 15 years ago by a man uh, uh, near you in Northern California um, named John Koza. He's a computer scientist uh, by training, um, but he's also, he's an inventor and a polymath and uh, a, pretty, a brilliant guy. And he came up with this idea of uh, an agreement among the states, interstate compacts are just basically contracts among many states to do something, whether it's uh, to negotiate water rights over a body of water that they share or create an interstate lottery commission or something like that. The interstate compact for the national popular vote group is an agreement among states who join it to award their electoral votes, not to the winner of their statewide vote, but to the candidate who wins the most votes in the entire country in all 50 states and the District of Columbia combined. Mm -hmm. When states representing a majority of electoral votes in the country, that's 270 electors, right? That's what you need to win to become president. When they join this compact, the compact takes effect and they all award their electors to the winner of the national popular vote. And that forces the candidates of both parties to campaign in a national election as though, as though every state and every voter mattered. So I think this is a, it's a brilliant, it's a clever and elegant design. It uses the existing constitutional structure, which means it doesn't tell states to do anything. It, states are allowed under the constitution, article two, section one of the constitution says states can award their electors however they choose. And this is just mm -hmm. saying, you know what? These states have been choosing to do winner take all in their state. They're just gonna do winner take all in the country. And states that jump on this are not telling other states what they can or can't do with their electors. Those states can continue to award their electors how they choose. But when 270 state uh, electoral votes worth of states join this compact, it kicks in, they all give their electors to the winner of the national popular vote. And you have the person who actually wins the most votes becoming president. 15 states in the District of Columbia have joined this compact. They represent 196 electoral votes now. Um, Virginia is sort of on the fence. If, if they joined, you'd be at, a, I think, 209. So you're, you know, 60, 70 to 60 to 75 votes away from this becoming a reality. It's far closer than any other effort has come since the late 1960s. And I actually think it's a, I think it has a lot to recommend it. Do you like what, is it just a matter of uh, majorities in each of the, you know, highly populated states or enough populated states to, to decide to do this? What, what, how does this, 
come into effect? Well, in, actually, in those the, other states? the member states are big states. There's medium states and there's small states. Mm -hmm. um, what what does distinguish the states from that have joined from the states that haven't, unfortunately, is a partisan lean. So. Uh -huh. All the states that have joined to date are what we call blue states, right? Are states that have yeah. democratic leadership when they passed this compact. Um, now that is not reflective of the interest in and support for the compact all around the country. Uh, in 2016, actually there were of, I think around 310, 320 co-sponsors of legislation to do this. Uh, they were roughly evenly divided between Republican lawmakers and Democratic lawmakers. Uh, it's passed Republican led chambers in several states. And in, in 2016, three Republican led states were on the verge of passing the compact into law. And then the election happened Everybody freaked uh -huh. out, ran back to their corners because, you know, suddenly it looked like you had a oh, big right. fight about this. Right. You had, right. Well, and you realize Republicans realize, oh, wait a minute, the Electoral College does help us, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, right. So that was a real setback for this compact. But the compact is run by a team of people who are both conservatives and liberals. And they go around the country and they meet with state lawmakers who are their who are their clients, basically, because it's state lawmakers who have to make this decision. And they explain mm -hmm. to them, they explain to them what the compact is, how it works. They break down the misconceptions and the myths about the Electoral College and the popular vote. And they say to me, you know, I spent a lot of time with these people and they said to me, when we can get anybody in a room for six hours, we can convince them. And, that, yeah. and, it's, and it's really, I have Fun. to say, they're right about that. And I've watched them sort of win over uh, uh, lawmakers, skeptical lawmakers of both parties. You know, there's a lot of Democrats mm -hmm. out there who are also skeptical of jettisoning, and jettisoning the Electoral College, certainly more Republicans, but it's, you know, people, people like, you know, they stick to what they know. There's inertia, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. These guys are really pushing to change the way people think about both what the Electoral College is and how it functions in the country. And I think they're doing a remarkable job at it. Whether they can get those last 60, 75 votes, I think depends a lot on what happens over the next few years. Yeah. Uh, okay. We have some questions from the audience, so um, uh, let's get to them. Uh, what role? What role does race play in the electoral college? Uh, it's such an interesting question. I mean, you know, the electoral college. Um, you know, from the very beginning up until today, you can sort of see the echoes of. Uh, America's original sin, you know, that, you know, it's conceived in this, this moment of, of slavery and, and, and exclusion. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I didn't say, but which you find if you read the book, is that the effort in the late 1960s that came so close to abolishing the Electoral College, we were really the closest we've ever been, was killed by three Southern segregationist senators, Strom Thurmond, Jim mm -hmm. Eastland, and Sam Irvin. Um, and they knew exactly which side their bread was buttered on. They did not want to give, you know, new power to the black voters in their states because those voters had been essentially invisible for a hundred years. Ever since, you know, uh, the, the end of the Civil War, they had, you know, they had had a few years in reconstruction of this incredible political participation, and then that was squashed um, by the Redemption, and you know, they were mm -hmm. they didn't exist again until the 1960s. So yeah. really race, and even today, if you look throughout the South, you know, millions and millions of, of black voters uh, are essentially rendered invisible because of that winner take all rule, because the South has mm -hmm. a majority of white voters and, and voting on in the South is so racially polarized, meaning you know, whites vote for Republicans and blacks vote for Democrats at rates far higher than anywhere else in the country, that that gives those states Republican victories, meaning all of their electors go to the Republican candidate, all those millions and millions of black voters in the South have not had a single electoral vote, you know, represent them in mm -hmm. in decades. So I really think, you know, you can ever you cannot obviously you can't pull race apart from any of the political and electoral developments in this country's history. But the Electoral College is a particularly obvious one. And it's it's just such a um, it's such a uh, it's such a painful reminder of this country's past. Um, but I think it's also points, it's, it's, a, it's a hopeful, um, there's, a, there's a hopeful part of this too, which is that we can change it in ways that we can't change other things about both our past and our, and our political structure. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question from the audience. Um, this is not exactly about the electoral college, but just about the election. So um, what do you think we should be most concerned about as we head into the 2020 election, which looks, you know, uh, 
confusing and just more thrown into more uh, possibly chaos yeah. because of the, the coronavirus. Yeah, right. I mean, even before coronavirus, uh, I would have yeah. probably said these two things, but they both uh, carry more weight to me now. Um, number one is that that everyone gets to vote. Uh, and so I think, you know, making sure that uh, vote by mail, that no excuse absentee voting is available everywhere is really critical. Um, most states actually do have no ab no excuse absentee balloting. So that's a good thing. My own state of New mm -hmm. York does not, um, which is uh, infuriating. We're, we are in the dark ages in many ways in, in terms of electoral, uh, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, good, good voting practices. Um, uh -huh. but, but especially given the pandemic, I think it's really crucial that, that states uh, ramp up their capacity to handle mail voting immediately so that everybody who wants to cast a ballot can cast a ballot without question that we can count those votes and make sure that they've all been collected, they've all been counted accurately, and that we have results. Um, so, so that's number one, is just access to the polls, access to the, access to the ballot. The other one um, is, an, is a question of, uh, you know, it's unique to Donald Trump, I think. And um, all I can say is, you know, Donald Trump is so, uh, he's violated so many of the, of the basic uh, norms that we think of as governing our um, politics and, uh, you know, of, of fair play and of, and of uh, mm -hmm. assumption of good faith uh, on the other side. And what I fear most is that, and, and I think is pretty sure to happen if he were to lose, is that he will call the election uh, illegitimate. Um, yeah. Now, remember, the irony is he did this in 2016, even though he won. I remember, yeah. Right. <laughs> he said, I've never heard someone do this before. He said the election that he won was rigged, right? So, <laughs> right. I mean, of course he's going to say it's rigged if he loses. The hard part is now he has the bully pulpit of the presidency. He has tens of millions of supporters who appear to be willing to follow him wherever he goes, even if it's off a cliff. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know what is going to happen if Donald Trump loses the Electoral College and the popular vote in November. And he says, this was a sham. This was phony. There's fake ballots everywhere. I, you know, I could write you the script right now. I know what he's going to say. And it will be from the cities. It will be from the areas where there are more black voters, right? It'll be from the areas where there's more Latino voters, right? That's, mm -hmm. his, that's, that's always been his playbook, right? His racist division yeah. and all of that. So when he does that, which he, I guarantee you he will, I really fear for what comes next. If there, you know, if people who have, uh, 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 who are angry or who have guns or who have a grudge against um, everything that they don't like about this country are going to be egged on by the president of the United States between November and January to do things mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, could cause a lot of harm. Um, and Donald Trump is going to be egging them on as he always has done. Uh, that really, that really frightens me as much as anything. Uh, well, the next question is just going to ask you to give the opposite answer. Do you have any hopeful message for someone that will be voting in their first election this fall? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> look, this is one of the messages of my book is the arc of American history is one of increasing democratization, right? And that that is what you've mm -hmm. seen all from the beginning, right? This country is is, is founded on these audacious ideals of, of, of universal human equality. No, 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 no country had ever tried to do that before. I mean, that's an incredible uh, aspiration. And yet, of course, we didn't come close to living up to it at the beginning, right? A 5%, yeah. maybe 5% of, of uh, people living in the country were allowed to vote. I mean, it's just a, just a minuscule fraction of Americans, not black people, not women, not Native Americans, not poor or white people. So. The first thing you do is you strip away the property qualifications and those poor white people start to vote. Then, of course, you have the Civil War. Uh, it takes deaths of 600,000 people, but you actually get uh, in the enfranchisement and, and the, uh, of black people. And then you have uh, women's suffrage in 1920. Uh, then you have uh, the expansion of the vote to the 18-year-olds in 1971 and 1972. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, at every oh oh and also just to include the uh, direct voting for senators direct voting for your electors right. all of these all of these changes are in the direction of more enfranchisement more inclusiveness more egalitarianism and more democracy and i really think that to me when i look at the news today when i open the newspaper today or um, i guess now it's just open my screen every day uh, i'm filled with despair uh, and i'm and i am fairly scared about the future of the country. Then when I pull back 
And I look at the arc of American history, I actually feel a lot more hopeful because I, I have the, that deeper understanding of how at every inflection point, almost every inflection point, we have moved in the direction of a more inclusive, more representative and more egalitarian society. I think that can only continue to happen. The Electoral College is the next natural point on that arc. And I think that's mm -hmm. the one we have to focus on. The Senate is another serious point of uh, distortion, but that's not gonna be changed. I'm not gonna, ar I mean, we can argue about that till the, the end of the, yeah. you know, the end of all time. You think it's just, that's just too far gone? <laughs> like that's just too, it's, I mean, it's baked it's, in the constitution. It's like- It's, a, it's a not just in the constitution. Picture. It's not just in the constitution. It's literally unamendable. The Senate is literally okay, by but, its own, you know, by the Constitution's own terms, you cannot get rid yeah. of the Senate, even if you wanted yeah. to. So um, I mean, forget the Senate. <laughs> just like the the, uh, the the end run that some people talk about it uh, here in California is to just split our state into multiple yeah. states. Like, um, don't is go that, down. Is that, do you think? <laughs> oh, think about it. Think about um, it. You start doing that. Just um, talk about slippery slopes. Then Texas does it. Then whoever, you know, everybody, all the big states. Oh, my God. I don't even th that's not the solution. The Senate is a major obstacle to a lot of reforms, a lot of good reforms. But, you know, you can. Uh, it, it's one of the features. It's one of the, on um, you know, undemocratic features of our Constitution that we're going to that we are stuck with. And there are ways yeah. to deal with that. There are ways to deal work, work with it and work around it so that it doesn't have the kind of sheer um, obstacle quality that it has under Mitch McConnell. Yeah, uh, we have uh, if we can, uh, uh -huh. so they would realize or be concerned about it and you know, change their minds a little. Well, so, so I have two chapters in the book where I sort of play that game and I create this, um, my pretend interlocutor who I think of as sort of my uh, angry uncle at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, <laughs> I love my uncle, but um, you know, arguments at Thanksgiving dinner are a common feature of American life. Yeah. And so I sort of, I have a sort of an imagined dialogue with this person and sort of attempt to convince him or her uh, of the rightness of my position. I actually think I have the easier argument here. I think the argument that all people should be counted equally in voting for the president of the United States is a pretty easy argument. And I actually think the people defending the college have the harder argument to make. So right off the bat, I think I start with a lead. But when it comes to actually convincing people on the merits, I don't think anybody really believes in the Electoral College, except maybe a few political scientists and lawyers whose arguments I find inscrutable to the point of uh, just mystifying. Uh, I, I think, in fact, most Mer Americans who defend the Electoral College are defending it for the reason that people have always defended the Electoral College, and that's because they think it helps their side. One part, uh -huh. of the, one part of the story in 19, of the late 1960s that I didn't tell you before is that it wasn't just the Southern segregationists who killed the Electoral College Amendment. It was, they were joined by and helped by black liberal political leaders in the North, in Northern cities like New York City and Chicago. Why is that? Because at the time in the late 1960s and throughout the middle of the 20th century, those states, New York, Chicago, those were the biggest uh, swing states in the country. Mm -hmm. And it was un that was widely understood. Everyone knew it was true. Those states, the, they were swung by their, uh, uh, their racial and ethnic minorities in the big cities. That's who decided the election of the president. Mm -hmm. They knew they had this outsized majority, uh, this outsized power in the Electoral College, and they defended it because for the same reason that the Southerners did, they felt that it gave them extra power. I just, I just want to read you a very brief, um, a quote here. This is from a, a southern, a southern uh, representative to Congress in 1950, making this point. And I just want to, I want you to hear it and just listen to the echoes of today. Um, this, he's, he's complaining about the fact that black people in the North have this unfair advantage um, mm -hmm. under the winner-take-all rule. Now, please understand, I have no objection to the Negro in Harlem voting and to his vote being counted, but I do resent the fact that both parties will spend 100 times as much money to get his vote and that his vote is worth 100 times as much in the scale of national politics as is the vote of a white man in Texas. And he, go, he goes on on this, on this, on this uh, theme. And the point is, conservatives hate the Electoral College and the winner-take-all rule just as much as liberals do when it hurts them. In 2000 uh -huh. and 2016, it didn't hurt them, it helped them. And so they defend it instinctively. But I really think that defense is paper thin and it will, it will fall apart the moment that 
uh, they realize that the Electoral College works against their interests rather than for them. Nobody likes the Electoral College except insofar as they think it benefits them politically. Yeah. Um, I, I do, I do, I mean, the, the way, the defense you hear of it often is, um, uh, like people would like the presidential candidates would spend all their time in California, New York, if we didn't have it. And there's this there's this real um, kind of anti like urban or anti coastal kind of right. view in it. Um, and it, I was watching uh, the Iowa mm. caucus this year, and like other than their vote problems, I realized that the way that they have awarded votes was also like an electoral college system uh, in in the caucus counting. And like I think uh, Bernie won more of the votes, but Mayor Pete got. Uh, one because he, he won votes more in more parts of Iowa. And it seemed to me like that seemed like a fundamental feature for them to not have the, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the like urban votes or the votes from big cities count the same. Like you had to go all over to visit them. For the, like, what is it about people? Like, I guess, what is it about, why do we still value sort of like the voting power of empty land in some sense? Like, why do people think well, that way? You know, in that, in those one person, one vote cases, the uh, from the 1960s in the Supreme Court, uh, which didn't have to do with the presidential election, they had to do with legislative, yeah. state, and congressional uh, seats. Um, their famous line from Chief Justice Warren was, uh, 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 "Legislators represent people, not uh, trees or acres." So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's that's as eloquent a way of putting it. Uh, and and when you see those maps that say. Donald, look at this map. Donald Trump won 85% of all counties in America. And it's like, that's convenient, isn't it? Given that those most of those counties are just basically dirt, you know? But yeah. um, I think I think the important thing to remember here, and this is something that was really a fun part of the book for me, was the last chapter, chapter nine, I spend talking to people who actually run presidential campaigns, the campaign managers, the field directors, the ground game coordinators. And I said to them, how did you run to win the Electoral College? And what would you have done to win a popular vote? And their answers were fascinating to me because one of the things they explained was that in a popular vote election, and they actually run popular vote elections, not in the country, but in battleground states. Battleground states are the yeah. best proxy for a popular vote election. And that's because they, they, they follow the same rules, which is every vote counts the same, Every vote matters and the person who gets the most wins, right? That's what, mm -hmm. that's what happens in any battleground state. Like, like let's, what let's, you would expect an election to be. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's what, so take Michigan. In those states, mm -hmm. you look at where the candidates go to campaign. They go everywhere. They don't just mm -hmm. go to the big cities. Um, take uh -huh. Ohio, for instance. They don't just, they, they don't ignore the rural areas. They go everywhere based on where people live. They go basically almost exactly proportional to where the population is. Now, yeah, does that mean they go more to the cities? Yes, of course they do, because there are more people there. They don't go disproportionately mm -hmm. to the cities though. They also go to the rural areas because they know if they're going, even if they say they're gonna lose in the rural areas, they wanna lose by less because they want to uh -huh. win as many votes as they possibly can everywhere. You ask any gu gubernatorial candidate, of course they go all over the state. So this idea, I think that's very common that I see on social media all the time, which is that candidates will ignore the, you know, the small states or the rural states or whatever you wanna call them in favor of places like San Francisco and New York City, those, like, you know, those kind of scary big metropolises. It's just not borne out by the facts, by the way that candidates campaign right now on the ground. And I think if you had mm -hmm. a popular vote election, you would see that same dynamic playing out. Candidates would go everywhere. Yeah, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this is not an electoral college question either. It's a Supreme Court question. Um, with the current COVID shutdown, what Supreme Court cases could be impact, uh, impacted? And what do you think of the remote broadcast format? <laughs> um, well, I listened to the first one on Monday um, and mm -hmm. I wrote a little piece about it for the paper, which was uh, uh, fun to do. Um, I missed the toilet flush yesterday. Uh, I heard, I heard somebody, <laughs> yes. I heard somebody on some identified either justice or lawyer flushed a toilet in the middle of the argument, uh, which was not, I think, the thing that people were thinking would make the justices not want to do live broadcast. But you know, surprises abound. Um, you know. This actually just gives me a good opportunity to make a quick plug for the Faithful Selectors case, which is being heard next Wednesday. This is a case that is about that question that we talked about at the very beginning of this, which was uh, the Alexander Hamilton's uh, Federalist paper about the Electoral College, which described the college as being this body of, you know, 
deliberative, thoughtful, educated men who would make the best decision in the interest of the country. Um, the, what faithful selectors are are electors who vote against their don't don't choose the don't elect the don't vote for the party's candidate right they vote for somebody mm -hmm. else. Um, mm -hmm. That it's essentially a violation of the idea of what Hamilton presented, but of right. course. That's how it's always been that that electors have always voted for the candidate of the party that they are a member of. You know, there aren't there isn't just one slate of electors in a state. Every candidate has their own slate of electors. So uh -huh. those electors are incentivized to vote for that candidate, not for anybody else. So that's why we've never seen anywhere anything more than a small handful of faithless electors in any election. So that what the Supreme Court is going to be deciding in that case is can states actually punish or even replace uh -huh faithless electors, electors who vote for somebody else. Uh, I actually, I'm, I'm in the camp that thinks that the outcome of this case is not going to matter. Whichever way the court decides, and I could see them deciding either that states do have that power or that they don't. I think there's interesting arguments both ways. I don't think it's going to matter because electors have now, have always and still today do vote for the candidate of their party. They care about, they are, they are party right. loyalists. The party, they are, they right. are chosen because they are party loyalists. They are not going to say, hmm, wait a minute, I'm suddenly going to vote for somebody else. We saw it in 2016. There was this big push that I detail in the introduction of my book, which was trying to get uh, Republican electors to vote for someone other than Donald Trump. As it happened, only two did, <laughs> you know, not close mm -hmm. to enough to keep him out of the White House. Uh -huh. I think fundamentally that case um, is going to, uh, come out one way or the other, and it's not going to have a real impact on the Electoral College's functioning. I think the real thing that will have an impact is the National Popular Vote Compact or something like that, that will allow us to change the way the college functions and elect the president directly. All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Jesse, for um, author of Let the People Pick the President, for joining us this evening. Uh, we encourage you to order your copy of his book through your local ind independent bookstore or barnesandnoble.com. We also want to express our appreciation to all our viewers joining us online. I'm Farhad Manju, and this virtual program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>